All right, well, good evening, y'all, and welcome to this edition of History and Highball, Somerset Place. Uh, my name is Stacy, and I handle adult education here at the North Carolina Museum of History, and we're so glad that you're joining us for this evening's um, History and Highballs program. Um, if you enjoy tonight's program, we invite you to head over to the museum's website at ncmuseumofhistory.org where you can learn more about our upcoming programs, exhibits, and digital resources. Uh, this is also where you can find more information about joining our North Carolina Museum of History Associates. Uh, our Associates and Foundation provide crucial funding and support to the museum, which in addition to many other things, helps make programming like this evening's event possible. Uh, we would also like to thank those of you who donated funds towards this evening's program. We do our best to keep our programs true to attend, but there are costs associated with keeping our series going. And we just continue to be so appreciative of your generous support of the museum. A few quick housekeeping items for this evening. We ask that you please keep your mics muted throughout the entirety of the program and to please type any questions that you have for our guest speaker into the chat function located at the bottom center of your screen. At the end of our program, I will ask our speaker as many of your questions as time allows. So it is my honor to introduce and welcome this evening's speaker, Krista Hobbit, who is the Assistant Site Manager for Somerset Place. Krista, I'm going to turn it over to you. Welcome. Thanks for being with us. Hi, thanks. I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, let me um, see if I can share my screen. <laughs> Um, so thank you, Stacy. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here with y'all tonight, um, especially after we had to postpone due to even more technical difficulties on my end a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> um, I'll start briefly by just giving you a, a, a little bit of um, information about who I am, why I am at Somerset Place. Um, I'll just say that my love of history has been um, ongoing for many years, but it really started um, when my sister and I started studying British history in preparation for just a fantastic trip uh, to England and Wales that we got to take with our uncle and aunt. Um, that was in May of 1996. Um, and so that, that started this love of history for me, and I eventually majored in history in college many years later, um, and I got my start in historic sites. Um, in 2016, when I interned at Historic Stagville State Historic Site, which is just north of Durham in that area, and then I started at... Um, Somerset Place uh, the following year in 2017 as a historical interpreter. And um, just now a little over two years, I've been the assistant site manager um, starting in February of 2020. Um, but you know, enough about me, let me jump in here to this wonderful presentation, hopefully. Um, in case some of y'all are not familiar with the history of Somerset Place, I'm gonna start real briefly with a little bit of um, background information. Uh, so pre-1865, uh, so let me start here. All right, so um, Josiah Collins III, um, he was the third generation of the Collins family that owned Somerset Place. His father, Josiah II, and his grandfather, Josiah the first, ran the plantation previously, um, but both had run the plantation from their home in Edenton. And Somerset Place was more of a side business for them. Josiah the third and his wife, Mary, were the very first and only resident plantation owners of Somerset Place. Josiah and Mary had six sons, no daughters, just the boys, and they were born between the years of 1830 and 1842. Um, tragically, though, uh, three of their sons died young due to accidents on the plantation. And on the eve of the Civil War, the Collinses enslaved 328 people at Somerset Place. Um, making it one of the largest uh, plantations in North Carolina. All right, so early on in the um, Civil War, um, the Union Army had quick victories along the Outer Banks 
um, in Roanoke Island. Um, and so this, these victories, um, they prompted the Collins family, family to flee from Somerset Place, which is right here on the map. I think you can see it with my uh, pointer. Um, and they fled to behind Confederate lines all the way to Hillsboro, North Carolina, um, which is over here. Um, there are three sons, Josiah the fourth, George and Arthur, uh, they enlisted in the Confederate army and all three sons survived the Civil War. However, though, um, Josiah III died unexpectedly in June of 1863 at their refugee home, which was formerly the Burwell School in Hillsboro. And you can see it here uh, on this slide. All right, so here we have left to right, we have George Collins, um, Arthur Collins with that arrow over his head, and then Josiah Collins the fourth on the far right. Um, all three of them made their way back to Somerset Place um, along with their mother, Mary, in the summer of 1865. Um, what they found there was um, that the plantation was in much disrepair. Uh, there were overgrown fields, overgrown drainage ditches, and overgrown canals as well. Also, the now newly freed people were planting crops for their own consumption. Um, the tension between the Collinses and most of this formal, former enslaved community uh, was, were running high. Um, the Collinses had gone into a great deal of debt during the war, um, and they desired to go back to the pre-Civil War power structure of the plantation. Um, the Collinses refused to pay the freed persons, and they also refused to set up um, a tenant system with them as well. Now, the over 200 newly freed individuals refused to go back to that whole power structure. Uh, and the result is um, all but 10 of these persons um, leave the plantation by the end of 1865. All right. All right, so Josiah IV, um, moves back to Hillsboro, North Carolina then with his wife, Sally, and their children. George also eventually settles back in Hillsboro with his wife, Annie, and their children. Arthur, though, remains at Somerset Place with his mother. In 1867, due to the wartime debts, Mary deeds Somerset Place to her nephew, William Blunt Shepherd whom she owed his inheritance to as well. William never moved to the plantation, but he allows his Aunt Mary to live the rest of her life at Somerset. Mary lived in the colony house, which was actually the former boarding school for her children. And she lived there until she passed away in April of 1872. All right. William, though, he hires his cousin, Arthur Collins, to be the manager for Somerset Place. Arthur continues in this role until he moves to his own newly constructed home called Weston Farmhouse. He moved there in 1875. That same year, due to his own mounting debts, William Blunt Shepherd um, transfers the deed of Somerset Place to another Collins cousin, uh, Mr. Herbert Henry Page. So Herbert Page also never moves to Somerset Place, but he hires a Mr. Sexton to manage the land. 65 years later, one of Mr. Sexton's daughters, a Mrs. T. C. Holmes, was interviewed about her time living at Somerset as a child with her family. Mrs. Holmes uh, recalled many things about her time at Somerset, but her closing line is very telling. She says, quote, so the old order changes yielding place to the new, 
But although the glory of the past has faded, the memory of those days linger in the hearts of those who have known and loved the old Somerset farm. Mrs. Holmes is remembering a very romanticized view of the past. In these memories, there is no room for the hardships and brutalities that the enslaved people experienced. Now, Mrs. Holmes lived at Somerset in 1885, so that romanticized version of the past was just 20 years after the Civil War ended. Herbert Page, though, he sells uh, Somerset Place in 1889 to a Mr. Harvey Terry. The results of this sale means that after 100 years, Somerset Place is no longer owned by any of the Collins relatives. All right, so meanwhile, uh, at the same time period before uh, Herbert Page sells Somerset, his cousin Arthur Collins, again, he moved into his own home, Weston Farmhouse. Um, he did this after his mother died. Um, and Weston Farmhouse uh, was located roughly two miles west of Somerset Place. Arthur hired day laborers and tenant farmers, um, including those who had been previously, previously enslaved by his family, including the butler, Luke Davis. But due to mounting debts of his own, Arthur sells Weston Farm to his cousin, Herbert Page, in 1886. And Arthur was the last immediate member of the Collins family to own land at Lake Phelps. So here we see Augusta Ann or Gastana Collins, and she's seated in this picture. Um, Gastana was born into slavery around 1846 at Somerset Place. She was emancipated in June of 1865. And soon after, she married James Limit Cabarrus, who's standing in this picture. Um, James Limit Cabarrus was also uh, once enslaved at Somerset Place. Um, they lived and worked at Weston Farm for Arthur Collins, and they started their family there. But around 1878, they moved to the community of Cherry. And sometime after, they acquired land in the newly established town of Cresswell. Both the Cherry and Cresswell communities became havens uh, for freed persons from Somerset Place and the neighboring Pettigrew plantations as well. The section of Cresswell where James and Gustana owned land was affectionately known as, quote, Gus Town, in reference to Gustana. And it is actually still known as this today by some of the locals in the area. Here we have Ransom Bennett Sr. Um, Ransom Bennett was the son of Washington and Jenny Bennett, and all of them had been enslaved at Somerset Place. In 1867, Washington and Jenny Bennett were actually deeded 10 acres of land in the area that would become Cresswell in 1874. When the town of Cresswell was incorporated in 1874, Ransom served as the town's first constable. He also purchased three acres of land where he opened a store. He also farmed 15 acres of cotton and he worked in construction. His wife, Catherine, also purchased an acre of land in Cresswell in her name and she opened her own store there as well. Ransom's parents, Washington and Jenny, they donated a little over one acre of land for the new St. Mark African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. And that church is still there today. All right, so here we have the oldest known photograph of the Collins home, circa about 1890. Um, this was during the time period when Harvey Terry and his family were living in the Collins home. Harvey's sister-in-law, Jane Davis, lived at Somerset Place 
with her sister and brother-in-law for a few years. Many years later, Jane recalled arriving for the first time when she was a small girl. She remembers, quote, one striking thing about the drive home was three rows of giant trees that formed two driveways to Lake Phelps. One driveway was used for carriages, the other for horse carts and wagons along the banks of the canal that had been dug by slave labor for over seven miles from Lake Phelps to the Scuppernong River. All right, so here we have a view of portions of Somerset Place from the viewpoint of Lake Phelps. And this is circa 1898. And this photo gives us a, really a wonderful view of portions of um, the owner's compound, as well as the enslaved community. On the far left over here where my pointer is, we can see the original hospital structure. To the right of that is the wood house. And to the right of that structure and just slightly behind was the storehouse there. And then to the right of that uh, is the colony house, which was constructed to be the boarding school for Josiah and Mary's six sons. And just next to that, we can see behind this tree, uh, the small building that was the dairy for the Collins family. Of these structures we see in the photograph, um, only the colony house and the dairy are still standing today. Although the state did reconstruct the hospital, um, but we'll get to that in a later slide. All right, so here we have a picture that's circa right around uh, early 1900s. Um, and we can see the carriage drive and canal um, that are situated um, just as Jane Davis described them a couple of slides ago, where she said, um, quote, one driveway was used for carriages, the other for horse carts and wagons along the bank of the canal. So here's the canal for the carriages. And then on the other side of the trees was for the horse carts and wagons. So that's pretty cool. All right. So this picture was uh, taken off the lakeshore circa around 1910. And this is one of two known photographs of houses within the enslaved community right over here. Um, the structures here um, on the left side are of the original one story slave dwellings. Um, by the time this photo was taken, these buildings served as houses for some of the tenant farmers in the area. Um, this is really an invaluable photo for us um, because it's the only decently clear photo that we have of the original slave dwellings. And this photo brings to life what ledger entries and archaeological excavations have told us about the houses within the enslaved community. So we're going to jump a little bit to uh, the 1920s. Um, and during this time period, the Rocky Mount Insurance and Realty Company owned Somerset Place. They hired George Smith to be the manager on site. And George lived in the colony house with his wife, Victoria, and their children. Here are a couple of pictures of their children uh, while they were living there. Uh, here on the left picture is Lana Smith. And in the right picture are five of his daughters. Um, left to right, they're Wilma, uh, Georgiana, Doris, Lona, and Hazel. Uh, these girls really kind of had the run of the owner's compound area where they played with their pets, uh, their pet cats and their pet chickens as well. Um, the Smiths did live in the colony house for close to a decade um, until George unexpectedly passed away in 1930. All right, in this picture uh, from the 1920s as well, we see the dairy behind the couple in front. Um, that had been converted at this point to a generator building. Um, some of the original louvers uh, have been taken out and windows put in. 
Um, and the generators there, they provided the electricity for the owner's compound area. Uh, the couple in the foreground are, is uh, Samuel Smith and his wife, Myra. Samuel was the oldest son of George and Victoria Smith. All right, so we get to fast forward again a little bit here to the mid 1930s. Of course, in the 1930s, the Great Depression was um, in full swing. It was still going strong. Um, and the federal government was trying to help poor farmers in the area kind of get back on their feet through New Deal programs like the Farm Security Administration. This agency purchased Somerset Place by 1937 for their resettlement efforts and named the project Scuppernong Farms. Um, and you can see the areas of Scuppernong Farms, they're highlighted in yellow on this map. Um, however, this project was for white families only. Um, the Farm Security Administration did create a separate segregated portion for African Americans, and they called that uh, portion, Weston Mutual Association. All right. So um, Uriah Bennett was interviewed by someone in the Farm Security Administration in 1937. Uh, Uriah was born into slavery at Somerset Place, and he is one of the only firsthand accounts we have from someone who had been enslaved at Somerset Place. Uriah states at the beginning of this interview um, that, quote, my mother's name was Annie and my father's was Ellie King Bennett. Mother was a field hand and father was also a field hand for Josiah Collins. Now, since both of Uriah's parents were field hands, that meant that Uriah as well was a field hand and slave person. Um, children learned the jobs that their parents did. So the pictures you see here are of the colony house and the Collins home, and they were taken roughly around the time period that uh, Uriah was interviewed in 1937. All right. So a couple years later in 1939, North Carolina signed a 99 year lease with the US Department of Agriculture and Pettigrew State Park is formally then established as the sixth state park in uh, North Carolina. The park encompassed, uh, encompasses Lake Phelps and the land on the north side of the lake. And that included um, what had been the owner's compound and the enslaved community at Somerset Place. This new state park though was for whites only at the time which meant that the only history taught about Somerset Place during that time period was about the Collins family. Um, the history of those who had been enslaved was ignored then. All right, so we time jump again um, to the 1950s. Um, and in 1951, um, history professor William Tarleton was hired to con conduct research regarding the built environment of the owner's compound, and then uh, in some areas uh, known as the street. Um, this project ran from 1951 to 1954 and started with William Tarleton conducting copious amounts of document research into the history of the plantation. Um, from there, um, after doing that initial research, uh, William Tarleton switched to conducting archeological digs around the grounds. Um, he discovered where the formal garden used to be, as we can see in this bottom picture. Um, and in the top picture, Tarleton is, we can see Tarleton working um, on the excavation of the Lake Chapel, which had been constructed within the enslaved community in the mid 1830s. In addition to the formal garden and the Lake Chapel, Tarleton and his team uncovered the foundations of the Overseer's House, uh, the Meat Rations Building, the Enslaved Kitchen Complex, the Hospital, 
the two-story Suki Davis house, the wood house, and the storehouse as well. So you didn't finish there though. William Tarleton also did paint analysis of the Collins home, the dependency buildings, and the colony house within the owner's compound area. It was determined that the original uh, color of um, the Collins house and the colony house uh, was a light tan color. The trim color was a bluish gray and the porch floors a grayish tan. Um, and here we can see in this 1953 photo that painters are in the process of painting the exterior of the Collins home back to its original color. So, so after Tarleton's restoration efforts of the owner's compound area, Somerset Place remains part of Pettigrew State Park for a number of years. Um, and that doesn't change until 1969, when Somerset Place is designated as the 14th State Historic Site on September 6, 1969. So, excuse me, Somerset Place is actually the only North Carolina state historic site that is situated within a North Carolina state park. And here we see the Collins House in 1969 at the time uh, that Somerset Place became a state historic site. Um, and here we can see that the house is pretty much fully restored to its 19th century appearance. All right, so we got another time jump here and we're jumping all the way to the 1980s. Um, but just a few years prior to that, the television series Roots uh, aired uh, in the late 1970s. Um, and while watching this series, Dorothy Sproul Refford was really inspired to start researching um, her own genealogy, where she came from. Over the course of the next six years, Dorothy conducted extensive research and was able to trace her ancestry back five generations um, to Peter and Elsie Littlejohn, both of whom had been enslaved at Somerset Place. But while tracing her own family's genealogy, Dorothy also ends up tracing the lineage of the entire former enslaved community as well. Dorothy visits Somerset Place for the first time in 1983, um, but she was disappointed by what she saw, or more accurately, I should say, by what she did not see at that time. Um, there was no physical representation of the enslaved community at the site beyond a couple of small wooden signs that indicated where the houses once stood that enslaved families lived in. There was also very little information being told about enslaved persons and the enslaved community at the historic site at that time. Now, Dorothy Refford set out to change that. She started by organizing an event called Somerset Homecoming. Um, and the first Somerset Homecoming was held on August 30th of 1986. Um, and on the next side, I will hopefully <laughs> play you a short video about uh, this first homecoming. 1,000 descendants of slaves gathered today at the North Carolina plantation where their ancestors worked more than 200 years ago. It was a homecoming to a home that exists now more in the heart and mind. But Douglas Kiker reports, now that these Americans have found their American roots, a great big family was reborn today. <laughs> It was a family reunion where long-lost relatives greeted each other with shouts of joy and hugs and kisses and tears. Well, she said your brother is her grandfather. Right. It also was a homecoming and a video where newly discovered relatives made acquaintance and traced common ancestry. I have the Civil War. Your father was there and his father was there at yeah, the same yeah. time. Uh, it was all of that, but most of all on this Labor Day weekend, it was a joyous American celebration. 
They are all descendants of slaves who once worked on this plantation, Somerset Place, on the North Carolina coast near the Great Dismal Swamp. Their ancestors came here as slaves, and they drained this swamp land, and then they farmed this land, generation after generation of them, as slaves. Yeah, but you, oh, you been 21 here. families. Yeah, been Today, their descendants, hundreds of them, came back to the plantation from all over the country for this get-together. They are attorneys, physicians, legislators, they're educators, they're farmers, they're housewives. North Carolina Governor James Martin proclaimed it Somerset Homecoming Day. Two direct descendants of the original plantation owner were on hand. I can't take any credit for it, and I hope people won't give me any blame for the fact that my ancestors lived there and owned slaves. I think we can only be responsible for what we do. A choir sang spirituals. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham. Oh, rock of my soul. They ate barbecue and fried chicken. They inspected the old plantation house. The slaves' quarters are long gone. They lined up to register by their original family names. Little John Cabarrus. Uh -huh. Cabarrus Collins. And this is the woman who made it all possible, Dorothy Redford, a welfare department supervisor in Portsmouth, Virginia. Inspired by the book Roots, she spent 10 years first tracing her own family's history, then those of the other plantation slave families. She did it, she says, so all the descendants could know where they came from and who their kinfolks are. This plantation is the only visual symbol other than us that we have, that our ancestors lived, worked, and died. God be with us till we meet again. We're very strong, very proud, very cohesive people um, who survived a lot and emerged um, healthy, mentally healthy. They're planning another reunion here in 1996. Douglas Kiker, NBC News, at Somerset Plantation, North Carolina. Um, so as we saw, that first Somerset homecoming uh, was a huge success. Um, actually, over 2,000 descendants of the enslaved community and the Collins family came to Somerset Place that day. And it was the start of changes to the historic interpretation of Somerset Place. Um, there were also subsequent homecomings in 1988, 1991, 1993, 1996, and 2001. And the photo we see here is of Dorothy Sproul Redford at the 1988 Somerset homecoming. So Dorothy Refford helped found our nonprofit support group, Somerset Place Foundation Incorporated in 1988. She also created a new plan for the site in 1988, which called for reorienting the site's interpretation. From this, we actually have our current guided tour, which gives a comprehensive social history of the enslaved and free people who lived and worked there. New archaeology was also done at the site in 1994, which resulted in the reconstruction of the Judy and Lewis house here on the left, which was one of the one-story slave dwellings. That was reconstructed in 1997. And in 2001, uh, reconstruction of the two-story Suki Davis home and the two-story hospital uh, was done as well. All right. So the, the last Somerset homecoming was held in the summer of 2001. The purpose of these homecomings had been fulfilled by bringing together long lost families. Now individual descendant families often hold their own family reunions at Somerset Place. And this next video clip, which will hopefully work, um, is from a family reunion that took place at Somerset 
in 2017. It's the Fonsdale Connection Reunion. Um, and these, uh, these people you see here are descendants of enslaved families who were forced to leave Somerset Place in 1843 and walk overland to Alabama. Um, and this was due to a division of inheritance between Josiah Collins III and his seven siblings. So let's see if we can get this one working. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I wanna welcome you to the Fonsdale Connection reunion. It was 10 years ago today that I brought the first descendants of Somerset to Eatonton and North Carolina and uh, Somerset Plantation to walk the grounds where our ancestors walked, worked, and lived. And I just wanna thank you all for coming and attending this reunion. Family reunions are social, but they are more history to me of the family and how we're connected than anything else. My name is Mary Jones Fitz and I am the organizer of this event at Somerset Plantation. I began organizing this reunion last year uh, when I found some newfound family members of my grandfather. It's not as easy as people seem to think it is for African Americans doing genealogy. It is not because there is a brick wall that you're gonna hit and that brick wall is slavery. My name is Mike Backus, and I'm on a wonderful trip to go back in time to visit the land that our ancestors walked on and connect the dots to where I come from. This journey actually started through a DNA search where we were trying to connect the dots between the two plantations who were sister plantations, the Farnsdale Plantation in Alabama and indeed the Somerset Plantation here in Cresswell. As it turns out, my ancestors, the Cabarrus, was a common name that connected the two plantations together. In 1843, as punishment for an act of rebellion, 80 enslaved people were taken from Somerset Place to the Fonsdale Plantation in Alabama. It's amazing once you watch, you uh, walk the grounds, and as you walk in their footsteps and you get the feel in here, because all of the stories that you read and all the stories that you heard are really connected when you're able to actually see, touch, and feel where they actually slept, ate, and worked. One interesting aspect of uh, touring uh, Somerset and tracing the ancestors, in the particular uh, family of Cabarrus's, there were carpenters, and there were uh, seamen, and then there were mu musicians, and there were painters, and there were artists, and as I walk among the grounds with relatives, we all have those skills. So that was amazing to realize that we don't know where they came from, but now we do. It is about connecting generations, about connecting lost generations, and to gather those people together for a reunion and see all of the smiles on their faces and to hear them talk about this place that their ancestors were on. And for me, this, I guess this is like the epitome of doing research is when I can find relatives and bring them back to the place where all of our ancestors came from. And it's just a joy to me. For so long, African-American history has been lost and not properly told. But by taking trips to places like Farnsdale and to places like Somerset, the actual history, the actual facts and events are laid out for you in the places that they lived and, and, and worked. So it becomes, it becomes real, it becomes realistic, and you're able to get almost a, a sense of aura to realize that the things that you do in your DNA and where you come from, you could actually see where it all started. Somerset Place is at 2572 Lakeshore Road in Cresswell. That's in Washington County. The State Historic Site is open Tuesday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Admission is free. For more information, give them a call at 252-797-4560 or go online to nchistoricsites.org slash Somerset. 
um, really we've come to close the closing now um, of my presentation. Um, but if you are interested in learning more about the history of uh, the people uh, and of Somerset Place itself, we have two guided tours that you can take at our site. Our regular guided tour, which focuses on the 1840s uh, and is available Tuesday through Saturday um, from 9 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. We also offer a guided tour called Somerset Place in the New South, uh, which is what this presentation has been based on. Um, that guided tour is available on the third Saturday of each month, as well as by reservation. And the tour goes into much more detail than what I was able to do this evening. Um, we also offer a few educational programs at our site for schools and other people and outright and outreach programs to schools and other organizations. Um, and our next site event is Days Gone By, which will be on Saturday, June 11th. So just a few weeks from now. Um, and so we hope to see some of you out here for one of our guided tours or one of our events. Um, but also Somerset Place is on social media. <laughs> we are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. If you do anything on these platforms, please give us a like, follow, or subscribe. Um, these pages are great resources um, to stay up to date with what we're doing at the site and also to learn more about the history of Somerset Place. Alrighty, so that's all I've got for this evening. Thank you so much for having me. And um, if you guys have any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer them for you. Thank you so much, Krista. And thank you for, um, you know, navigating all of our technical difficulties this evening. We appreciate you being with us. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. We have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is from Clyde and they ask, is this close to Iredell's plantation? Iredell, are you referring, is he referring to James Iredell from Edenton or Iredell I'm, County? I'm thinking uh, James Iredell. Okay, um, so Edenton is just across the Albemarle Sound from where we are located. Um, and so today it's just a short 30 to 35 minute drive from Edenton to our site. So that guy gives you guys kind of a good idea of um, the area um, with it's not that far of a drive from here in Raleigh. Absolutely. No. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, Phyllis says the house appears to have been built of wood. Is that typical for North Carolina? Um, were houses also built of brick? Uh, yes, yes and yes. <laughs> um, so the house, the exterior is wood, um, uh, the Collins home, um, uh, the slave dwellings were wood as well. Um, the slave dwellings were constructed on brick piers, um, so they're a little above the ground. Um, and the Collins family uh, house was also, is also on brick piers. Um, and also um, there is some brick um, in the walls itself of the Collins home um, as uh, kind of like insulation layers between the floors of the home. It's a very heavy house. Um, Sarah says uh, she's done extensive research that includes Fonsdale and she never made the connection, I guess, between uh, Somerset and the Fonsdale. Yeah, so yeah, one of Josiah's sisters, Louisa Collins, married um, Reverend Harrison, um, and, the, and they got married in 1842, and they are the ones that started this plant, uh, that new plantation, Fonsdale in Alabama, and so she, Louisa, she had inherited um, 81 enslaved people, and so those 81 were forced to, then to go to Alabama and start work at that new, uh, the Fonsdale plantation, so. Uh, Candy says Dorothy Redford was recognized as an outstanding North Carolina historic figure for her work with Somerset Plantation, um, and that honor was given to her by Our State Magazine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, she did amazing work uh, for Somerset Place, um, and, and all her research we do, we still, uh, she did, we still greatly benefit from it today, yeah. Um, 
Kivos 315 says, uh, is there an enslaved people cemetery on Somerset Plantation? Do you know? So that's a good question. Um, so um, the Lake Chapel, um, which was constructed in the mid uh, 1830s, um, there are records that ministers kept uh, in that chapel of, uh, of marriages, births, deaths, baptisms within the enslaved community, uh, of those who were enslaved. And so we do have a burial registry um, for enslaved persons at Somerset Place. Unfortunately, um, it just tells us that they were buried at Somerset Place. There are no written records that indicate uh, any area of where that cemetery uh, is or was. So um, Somerset Place was, um, uh, acreage-wise, it was 110,000 acres. Um, and so all we can say is it was somewhere on the 110,000 acres uh, the state now takes care of just 31 of those acres, um, and it is not on um, that those acreages. So we we unfortunately do not know where that cemetery is today. That's a huge amount of space. I had no yes. idea it was that it was that large. Wow. Yeah. Um, Renate, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, said, can you talk a little about the act of rebellion that led to some of our ancestors being sent to Fonsdale? I'm a direct descendant of Peter and Elsie, Amy and Mac, and then Pinky. Dorothy is my fir yeah. fourth cousin. Yeah, so the enslaved people being sent to uh, Fonsdale was not actually as a result of an act of rebellion. There were acts of rebellion, um, acts of defiance at Somerset Place by those uh, who were excuse me, my cat, who, those who were insane, uh, enslaved. Um, so the, 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 those who were sent to Fonsdale, that was solely as a result of division of inheritance between Josiah and his siblings. Um, and so that's what happened. Um, there were acts of defiance. There was one act, um, there was a, uh, one in particular that stands out is, um, there was a purported plot to poison one of the overseers, Joseph Newberry. This was in 1852, so nine years after uh, those enslaved people were sent to Fonsdale. Um, and so there was a, this rumor plot to poison the overseer. And because of that rumor plot, Josiah did sell 16 enslaved men and women to a slave trader. Um, where that slave trader took them after that bill of sale, we do not know, um, but yeah. Uh, Renate, Renat, I'm so sorry. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly. Uh, said, thanks. That's what I thought. Um, but in the presentation, it sounded as though maybe there was a connection. So thank you for yes. clearing that up. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer sounds like Renata. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Jennifer says when I visited, uh, Somerset place, hold on. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, when I visited Somerset Place, it seems that it was painted yellow. What color is the house now? Um, it is a yellowish tan color is what we call it. <laughs> so uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's this beigey yellowish tan color. It's the best I can describe it, yeah. Uh, also from Jennifer, are there any connections with the slave rebellion led by Nat Turner in Virginia, which is not too far away? Right. Um, there are not um, any connections between that and, uh, and Somerset Place. Um, however, um, huge connection between that and laws that were play, uh, passed in North Carolina shortly thereafter. Um, so um, laws were enacted after that rebellion that severely, even more so, restricted um, uh, the enslaved people. Um, so um, before that, if, um, if an enslaver so desired to um, emancipate um, uh, one of uh, any of his enslaved people, he was able to do so with very little um, inconvenience to him. Um, after that time, forward laws were enacted that 
um, if any enslavers wanted to um, free any of, of the enslaved people they owned, uh, they had to go through the courts. Um, they had to put up a $1,000 collateral per person they wanted to um, free. And then the, that now newly freed individual had, I believe it was 30 days to leave the state. Once they were free, they were not allowed to remain in summer uh, in in the state of North Carolina, um, and so that severely restricted, um, even more so, um, what uh, what happened to uh, the enslaved people at, in North Carolina. Um, Renata says you mentioned Hillsborough in the presentation, um, but not Hurry Scurry in Franklin County, where the majority of enslaved were taken during the war. Has there been any progress made in finding the exact location of Hurry Scurry? Many of the enslaved died and were buried there also. So yes, there were um, definitely, um, so during the Civil War, uh, she's right, 171 enslaved people were sent to this plantation, which was in Franklin County. Um, so just northeast of the Raleigh area. Um, and um from there, several of those enslaved individuals were then sold to, or, or rented out, I should say, um, to either the Confederate Army, um, various hospitals around the Raleigh area, um, the North Carolina Railroad, um, in order to, uh, by, by the Collins family renting these enslaved people out like that, they were hoping to, to make more money off of the enslaved labor um, that they had. Um, and so, yeah, and we do know that some of the enslaved people did die at Hurry Scurry. Um, we know approximately where it was, but there's not a, there's nothing left of that plantation. No, nothing of the built environment left of that plantation. Um, and so it has been a little tricky trying to track down exactly where it was located in, in Franklin County. But we have a, we have a rough estimate, we think. <laughs> Um, Jennifer and many others in the chat say, uh, thank you so much for this program. Uh, Jennifer says in particular, thank you for educating us on this important part of our history. Um, there is so much that I was never taught in school. Um, and Renata says, thank you for a great program. So thank you so much, Krista. Oh, we really appreciate welcome. you taking time to, to be with us tonight. Oh, I'm so glad it, it worked out finally. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> us too. <laughs> Um, and thank you to those of you who joined us this evening. We hope that you um, enjoyed it. And we hope to see you at our next History in High Balls, uh, celebrating 150 years with the Body Island Lighthouse happening Thursday, May 26th at 7 p.m. via Zoom. Uh, in the meantime, we hope that all of you have a lovely evening and stay well. Thanks, Krista. We'll see you later. That's great. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.